and we have a recording in progress, uh, which is great. So, um, whoops, <laughs> I don't want you to have to see that. Okay, I'll just minimize that. There we go. So this is an introductory session. Um, so I'm not gonna go deep into the woods or the weeds. Uh, I'm also gonna make sure there's time for people to ask questions and all of that. I'm gonna show you some things. I'm gonna do some things and we're gonna have fun for an hour playing with AI. So introduction to AI, what have we got? Go forward, there we go. So AI today, is used for everything. Uh, oh, geez, I'm gesturing madly. <laughs> um, it, it's it's used for everything. Uh, there are basically six major uh, major applications of AI, um, application areas of AI, I guess I should say. Um, and they include uh, things like description. This is um, you know using AI to capture a description of what might be a very complex environment. Uh, diagnostic to explain why something happened. Predictive. So you use AI, AI for example, in airplane parts to predict when the part is going to fail before it fails. Uh, prescriptive, uh, where the AI makes a suggestion to you about what you should do. You know, should you hire a person? Should you fire a person? Generative, which is what everyone's talking about these days. Um, making things, making pictures like the beautiful panda on this page. And then a category I've added in my own work, deontic, where the AI looks at everything we've said about ethics and decides what is the right thing to happen. Um, there's a link here on the slides and these slides will be shared after the session on uh, all the possible applications of AI. I've, I've spent a number of years just Every time I found something that used AI, I put it in the list. And uh, I captured a very large list of all the applications of AI. Um, should be seeing them here. So there's the descriptive, diagnostic, and so on. Um, and there is a mechanism if you see something else here, um, you can add to that list. Um, one very common application of AI that people don't talk about anymore, although they probably should, is automated, automated or automatic translation. Um, and this is everywhere now. Uh, simple little example. Let's look at my uh, website here. Now I'm using uh, an application called Firefox. And uh, I can translate my content here in Firefox. So, oh, I've lost. I did it just a second ago. There we go, translate page. So here, now, this is the, the page that I just showed you. I can pick one of a number of different languages. Let's go to Bulgarian and translate. And here's my page in Bulgarian. You know, I don't speak Bulgarian, so I can't speak to how good a translation that is. Um, but uh, maybe go to French. The French translation is pretty good. Um, now there's a weakness here and you've probably spotted it already. Uh, the the list of languages right now is pretty short. Uh, and it doesn't include indigenous uh, languages like Cree or Niktatuk. 
Um, and, you know, it doesn't include a lot of different national groups. And of course, the Asian languages aren't here. But um, many other translation services have a much wider range of languages, and it's only a matter of time before we see it in something like Firefox. Another thing AI does is face recognition. Um, you've probably seen this. I mean, I use this. Here's my phone. Well, you can't see it because I don't have video, but uh, I use thumbprints. I just put my thumbprint on the phone and it opens right up for me. Uh, no problem. Uh, I have a laptop in the other room. I open the lid on my laptop. The camera looks at me, says, oh, yeah, that's him, and just pops in. I don't have to um, log in or register at all. Now, there's all kinds of ways of using facial recognition, some good, some bad. Uh, recently, there was a case where a person was blocked uh, from going in to see an event at Madison Square Garden because the company that she was associated with was in a lawsuit with Madison Square Garden. Actually, she was a lawyer for the company representing the company that was in a lawsuit. And it recognized her and they said, no, you can't get in. Now, the question is, is that appropriate? Uh, we'll, we'll get to that. The big question is, how does this all work? Um, well, that's the big question for now. Um, because we think of artificial intelligence as a computer program, and it is a computer program, but we think of a computer program as a series of instructions, do this, then do this, then do this. But artificial intelligence is very different. It is not a series of instructions. We aren't telling the computer do this, then do this, then do this. It is a form of data processing. So what do I mean by that? Let's have a look. Here's what's happening in a simple image recognition program. The input is on the left, and you can see it's all kinds of different shapes. It's sort of dithered. Uh, it'd be hard even for us to tell what the number is, but it's run through a whole bunch of these processors and out the other end, the AI detects what number it is. So how does that work? Well, if you think about the input as we would with the eye, so we have layers of processors. The processors are all connected together. So the output for one processor turns into the input for another one. So on the left-hand side, we have all the vision, you know, the image of the thing. And then on the right-hand side, we have the output. So these are organized into layers and each individual processor we call a neuron or maybe a unit. And then the lines which send the signal from one processor to another, that's called an edge or sometimes it's called a connection. So here's kind of what happens. So here's the input. It's a matrix, in this case, of 576 dots. And each of these dots has a different value. So for, in this case, the values are the different shades of gray. And you see they sort of create values between one and zero. Uh, that's the standard that they use. It doesn't really matter, but that's what they use. So we take this array and actually line it up as a whole sequence of values. And that becomes our first layer in the processing that I just showed you. And so then we have the input data that comes in from the layer and is going to feed into the next layer, 
and feed into the next layer and finally the output. There's only two layers here. This is a relatively simple network. Now the values move from layer to layer. They, they as we say, feed forward and then they produce a result, in this case, D. Well, we can train these things by feeding back. That's feed forward, feed back. So if it wasn't really a D, we can send a signal that propagates back through all those layers and corrects all of those connections. And so the corrected values of all of those connections is what we call a data model. And this is what it looks like mathematically. You don't need to know this, but what's really interesting here is that this mathematical formula is one of many that describes all the different ways that we can change the configuration of these individual data processors and the connections between them to make it easier or harder to train or adjust this network of connections. And that in a nutshell is AI. If you understood everything that I've said so far, you have an understanding of how AI works. And uh, let's see if I can see the chat. Yeah, here we go. Uh, so if you have any comments, um, do feel free just to type them in the chat. Like for example, if you haven't understood what I've said so far, I'll see them. I'm just gonna move this off the screen, but I'll see them and I'll respond to them as you enter them in the chat. Um, and I'm sure Manisha will interrupt me um, if she gets if she sees a hand up or someone wants to comment. Okay. So it's all pretty complicated, but in a sense, it's all pretty intuitive as well. Here's a, an early type of AI that performs a different function. It's called clustering. And what this AI does is it organizes uh, groups of things, whatever they are, into clusters. And the way it works is it picks three random points represented by the X and then colors all of the individual things according to the nearest point. And then it moves those points so that it's at an average place uh, where all those colored points are. And then it repeats it and it repeats it and it repeats it. And eventually it forms a stable pattern that clusters whatever it's looking at into a certain number of groups, K groups, K number of groups. So this is called K means clustering. There's also a thing called K nearest neighbor clustering, which is a similar sort of thing. But this is how we use AI. It's a very similar process to what we just saw with recognition, but how we use AI to organize and sort things. And this is an important thing to keep in mind. One of the applications is automated grading of papers. You may have seen reference to that. Well, automated grading of papers is a clustering exercise. And what we're doing is we're taking all of the students' papers and we're organizing them into say five groups. A, B, C, D, E, F, A, B, C, D, E, F, six groups. Well, I guess there's no E, is there? So A, D, A, B, C, D, F, five groups. So we use an application. First, we train it by, you know, having it make predictions, and then we feed back our corrections in the form of actual grades that actual instructors have given papers. And then this model that we've trained 
is applied on new papers. And it sorts those new papers into the clusters. It just looks at the paper, just like it would look at an image, um, or just like it would look at some text to be translated. It looks at it and says, what category does this belong to, A, B, C, D, or E? And it's basically based on the similarity, the overall similarity of the paper to other papers that are A, B, C, D, or F. It's important to keep in mind you know, because we're we're so focused on uh, things like rubrics or rules, it's not looking at actual details that are in the paper. It's not even looking at the content of the paper. It doesn't care about the content of the paper. The content becomes relevant only when it's similar to other papers that got an A. So there can still be errors in a paper and it can still get an A. There can still be some really glaring errors in a paper and it can still get an A. But that could be true of a real student paper too. So it's just putting it into a category. It's based not on a small number of factors like did it say this, did it say that, does it have these three distinctions, whatever we might use but it's based on tens of thousands of factors, hundreds of thousands of factors, factors that go beyond what an average human instructor might consider. But if you think about it, it's kind of like what an instructor does anyways. It, at least an instructor that isn't grading strictly according to a rubric. Sometimes they do, but sometimes, most of the time, certainly when I was an instructor, I didn't. I'd look for some things, sure. You know, I mean, if if I was writing about, if, if I was asking people to write about the Battle of Hastings, I would expect them to say it happened in 1066. But if I'm reading a five-page essay on the Battle of Hastings, I'm going to be looking for a lot more than that. I'm going to be considering a wide variety of factors, some of which I could list out, but not all of them. And really what would happen is, as an evaluator, an experienced evaluator of student papers, I would simply recognize, oh yeah, that's an A paper. And I could explain why after, maybe. But when I'm grading it, Usually what I do is I read the paper and I say, okay, that's an A, that's a B. Um, you know, I might make comments on the paper, but really it's a process of recognizing. I can see, you know, having already graded tens of thousands of papers, I can see that this is an A. And it's going to stack up with all the other A's that I've ever seen. And, and that's kind of how automated grading works. You might think, really? Uh, do we really sort of think the same way? Well, let's look at look at something I call the projection game. And think about this. Um, the projection game is really simple. All I want you to do is think about and even say or put in the chat what word comes next. So try this out. Bacon and what comes next? Anyone? Okay. David said eggs. Erica said eggs. Merle said eggs. Eggs. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's interesting. I, Pretty much everyone said eggs. Yeah. Nobody says bacon and pork chops. Yeah. Nobody says bacon and clouds. Right. But we just recognize that the word that goes there is eggs. How about Wayne? Give it a try again. Ah, now it's more interesting. Wayne Campbell, who I've never heard of. Wayne Cox. Wayne Enterprise. Oh, okay, for Batman. Okay. 
Wayne Manor. Oh, I see Wayne Manor from Bratman. Oh, maybe I'm dating myself. I put Wayne Gretzky. How about American? What would you put after that? American made. Interesting. That's fascinating. American dad, American cheese, American idol, American pie, American. You notice how everybody's putting something slightly different in? Isn't that interesting? Although y'all have answers, American graffiti, and all of those answers make sense to everyone else. It's just you picked the one that you picked. What did I pick? American Idol. Yeah, dating myself. How about Justin? Timberlake. Yeah, I thought there might be some Timberlakes. Oh, just in time. Yeah, funny. Trudeau. Yeah, I put Trudeau. I live in Ottawa. What can I say? Uh, one more. Tried and true. Tried and died. Funny. Tried and tested. Interesting. Yeah, I put tried and true. So think about what's happening here, right? All the language that you've used in the past, all the language you've heard that you've seen, lets you recognize a familiar pattern. And that familiar pattern helps you figure out what comes next. This is exactly what. And AI is doing, for example, a large language model is doing exactly this. So you've heard of chat GPT, which we'll look at in a sec. Uh, it's called a large language model because it uses billions of bits of data, billions of examples, trillions of connections, about three trillion connections, actually, um, or edges, as we just saw, to, to make these predictions. And so it can do more than just bacon and eggs for Wayne Gretzky. It can do more complicated projections, but it's doing the same thing you did, and arguably in a very similar way. Uh, it's not looking at the content it's just looking at what everybody else did when they said bacon and or Wayne or whatever. So there's the prompt that we put into chat GPT, but you see here we can make it really big. And I'll play that again. Word one to word two or this whole paragraph, and then out comes a sentence. The same kind of thing, right? It's just bigger. And it's bigger because it has tons of data to work with. This is kind of what it looks like. Chat GPT looks at how we used all of these words, it looks at the context that these words happen in, all the different ways we've used these words in the past, or these phrases, or these sentences, and then it comes up with a projection. But again, all it's doing, right, it's based on this model which is this trained set of connections between input layers and output layers. And then using that model, you give it some data, it pops out an output. It's not popping the output because we tell it this is the best response or anything like that. It's popping the output because it's learned from all of these different examples very similar to the way you learn from all of your experience of language. Now, there's, there's some caveats, some things to think about here. Uh, it does not have access to 
all of the knowledge and experiences that you do. Um, it's never been out in the real world. It's never been in a forest. Um, it's never burned its hand on a stove like me. Uh, its conversations have been limited. It can't access dictionaries or Wikipedia or anything at all after 2021. So it's limited in its understanding of what really should come next. So here's chat GPT. Um, oh, I should probably, let's look at these limitations. So some examples of prompts that you can give it, some of the capabilities. Chat GPT can remember what the user said previously in the conversation, keeps track of that. So you can follow up and correct it. And it's trained, specially trained to decline inappropriate requests. So it's a separate functionality that they've added to the front of it. The limitations, well, because it doesn't have any experience in the real world and it doesn't have access to actual facts, it may generate incorrect information. As well, because there's bias and prejudice in the data that goes into the system, it may produce harmful instructions or bias in the output. And as I said earlier, it really doesn't know anything about the world after 2021. And from what I understand, some things have happened since then. So let's, let's look at chat GPT. So pretty straightforward. We'll just log in, you have to create an account. I just created one with Google. So there we go. And now I'm into chat GPT and uh, I can send it a message. Now, uh, what should I send it? What is a panda? <laughs> chat GPT is verbose. So it's going to tell me about what a panda is, and it'll list some factors. It's interesting. You look at this appearance, habitat, diet, behavior, conservation status, reproduction. It figured it should give me this list because I asked it, what is such and such an animal? And this is the sort of things that people would use the sort of things they would say when they asked, what is a panda? But let's have a little fun. What is a panda? Uh, Stephen, oh, is it yes. only um, in English language? It Mostly, gave us the results in English language because your question was in the English language? Yeah, so let's see if it'll give me the response in French. It's thinking. <laughs> this one's a bit harder for it, right? Here we go. So here we go. What is a panda? State the response in French. All right. Let's give it a better challenge. In Cree. <laughs> That's exactly what I was going to put in. This is interesting. It says, a panda is not a concept commonly found in Cree culture, as pandas are native to China and not part of the traditional Cree environment. And now it's gonna tell me that Cree is an Algonquin language spoken by indigenous peoples, primarily in Canada. So, um, as you can see, 
the results are not nearly as good when we ask for the response in Cree. And that points to one of the deficiencies of something like chat GPT. The vast bulk of its training comes from English with lesser training, less data coming from French and much less input data coming from Cree. So when you asked for it to come and put the output in Cree, it doesn't know what to do. It doesn't know how to respond. It responds inappropriately. And it's obviously much less than satisfying. I asked for it in limerick form. It gave me a limerick. So let's see if it follows the meter properly. In China's bamboo black and white, the panda's a wonderful sight. With patches of noir, they sit and dine, a symbol of nature's delight. Yeah, that's the right meter. That's not bad. So chat GPT is better at limericks than at Cree. That's definitely worth taking note of, right? And it points to some of the risks involved in using chat GPT. Some good advice uh, when using chat GPT, some, you know, giving it some prompts. Uh, you can talk to it as though it were a person and correct it. Let's come back to our example here. Is Cree and Algonquin language. Oops, helps if I spell Algonquin correctly. Eh? So it's saying, yes, Cree is an Algonquin language, and then it explains it a bit. What are other Algonquin languages? Uh, here we go. We're going to get a nice list. So now this is the challenge too. Suppose I'm a student and I'm writing an essay about Cree and I decide to cheat and use chat GPT to write my answer for me. Well, I don't actually know what languages are Algonquin languages and what languages aren't, what languages aren't. This is just something I don't know. So suppose I take this text and put it into my essay. I'm taking a huge risk here, aren't I? Because I don't know whether the statements here are true. Um, you know, is Naskapi and Innu really spoken by the Innu people in Eastern Canada? Well, if I don't know that myself, and I put that into an essay, I'm putting something into an essay that I don't know personally whether or not it's true, and it could very easily not be true. And so I'm making a significant mistake. Imagine if I used chat GPT uh, to make policy as a government. Well, now I'd be making my mistake and putting it right into policy. That, that could be dangerous. We have a question in the chat. Would text taken from chat GPT show up as plagiarism in a program such as turn it in and the answer is sometimes um all of these plagiarism systems um 
over the last few months, over the last six months or so, have connected the plagiarism detector to an AI detector of one sort or another. So e each one of them tries to detect whether or not the student essay was created by an AI. And there have been studies done on this. I've covered them in my newsletter. And, uh, if needed, I can give examples. Um, and it turns out that these AI detection systems are not accurate. They're not reliable. Um, there's a lot of false positives. And it turns out, especially for people who are not fluent in English, for people whose first language is not English, uh, these plagiarism detectors will, are much more likely to say, this was created by an AI um, than uh, people who are fluent in English. You can sort of see why, right? They see stilted English or grammatical mistakes and they jump to the conclusion that it must be an AI. Um, so you can't depend on uh, Turnitin or any other uh, plagiarism program to detect whether or not somebody has used uh, chat GPT or any other AI. Um, usually people discover it was an AI because it makes an obvious factual error, but yeah, sometimes students make obvious factual errors too. Um, coming back. Uh, you can do other things with chat GPT. You can have it pretend that it's a dentist um, or a historian or a hockey player. As, as we've seen already, we can do multiple attempts. Sometimes chat GPT will go off topic and you, know, you have to correct it and say, get back on topic. As we've seen, you can specify the output format. You can also put explicit constraints on response. You know, list the top five languages list the top 30 languages, uh, use four words in your response, use six words in your response, et cetera. You can also generate images using these AI systems. This is a fun one called Deep AI. So the prompt I used was um, create an image of a panda in a forest in pen and ink. So you see what I'm doing here, right? This is what I want. And now I'm putting a constraint on it. I want it in pen and ink. So I'll click generate. We can see it's generating here. It's going to take a little bit to generate. And there we go. There's a panda. I guess it's in a forest. I don't really, well, I do like that one actually. But, uh, let's pretend I don't like it. I'll do it again. And so we're running the model all over again. We get a different result. So people say, you know, well, these AI systems, they just copy images that are already there on the internet. Well, let's test that. We can test that really easily. We'll save the image. So I'm just going to save it to my website. I have an image directory here. It's just called output.jpg. Now uh, let's go to Google image search. All right, so image search. And now if I click on this little camera here, I can upload a file. And I'll upload the image that I just created. There it is. So there's the image. And I'll just select the entire image. And you see how it says find image source. It says no results found for the selected area. In other words, no results found for the image. This is this is pretty uh, consistent. Um, it's not able to find the image that the AI just generated. Well, you might say, well, yeah, it's the same system that generated it. Yeah, 
uh, or the image might be from a proprietary image library. Uh, but the, the most practical answer is uh, to say it's a new, completely novel image. And that's what it is. Uh, this image isn't copied. Uh, you know, the, the look and form are copied. Um, but, you know, you can make it less and less copy by specifying more specifically the output format. So it's an original image. It's similar to other images on the internet, but it's not a copy. Got a question from Merle. So what would be a practical way of using chat GPT in say schoolwork or writing articles and so on? Is it even recommended? And that's a pretty interesting question. Um, there isn't an agreed upon answer yet. Um, some people say, uh, well, you probably shouldn't be assigning questions uh, that can be answered by chat GPT. So don't ask them for, you know, the, the typical five paragraph essay because chat GPT is probably better than your students at producing five paragraph essays, even your A students. Um, similarly, you know, short answer quizzes or things like that, that they can just use chat GPT to answer, probably shouldn't be asking them anymore. It's just as, you know, students have calculators today or at least calculators on their phones, and so we wouldn't ask them, what is two plus two? Uh, you know, what is the square root of 1,403, et cetera. We just wouldn't ask them that anymore because um, they don't need to calculate it anymore. Other people have suggested, well, just make sure that they can't use computers when they're writing their essay. Um, that's pretty hard to do, seeing as people use computers all the time in word processing, for example. And, uh, you know, if I open up my word processor, like Microsoft Word, um, see if I can find a file that's, well, I'll just create a new one. That's what I'll do. So here's Microsoft Word, right? Well, <laughs> already it's giving me a bunch of templates, right? Uh, so create that. So here's my recipe. Isn't that beautiful? This is all done for me by word. Um, so, and I, I could probably, well, I can actually dictate to it. So it'll translate my audio voice to text. Uh, I can put uh, text in using artificial intelligence. Every All the tools I need are right in Word uh, because Word is owned by Microsoft and Microsoft has a major interest in OpenAI, which created ChatGPT. So that's hard to do. Uh, you might say, well, you have to use pen and pencil, but nobody uses pen and pencil anymore for anything. Uh, we got a long comment here, and uh, I'll put it on the screen so people can see it. Um, Stephen will have will probably have a more robust answer. Well, thank you. But previous panels and chats I've attended for AI in education discuss that many folks don't think it is a reliable resource for retrieving information. That's true. This is not what it's designed to do. Remember, we just looked at what it does. However, they have entered the information they gather and request, requested assistance in creating a writing framework for it to help organize their thoughts. Right. The writers then noted that the exact ways they utilized generative AI in their final results. In other words, they were very clear Here's what was contributed to my answer by ChatGPT. 
My particular institution, he continues, encourages open conversations with our professors to help guide how we might utilize generative AI in our work. So it's better for structure than for actual information input. Yeah, it's really good with structure. Um, it's really good at, at formatting, uh, whether it's the, the structure of the text or whether it's you know the uh, the design of a page or or things like that, really good at that. And that's where the answers that I'm seeing are kind of trending toward, where you create much more open-ended assignments, where the person would probably use AI and they'd go back and forth with it. They'd use it to structure their response. They'd use it to suggest possibilities. We understand that this will probably happen. It'll probably happen. It will happen. Um, but the idea is that the student works with the AI in order to come up with a response. And they are clear about not just, you know, they, they produce not just the final response, but are clear about or open about the process that they use to get that response. And so what they're being evaluated on is, isn't what they produced, but how they went about producing what they produced. And that's you think about it, that's a, a far more interesting kind of evaluation anyways, right? And then it doesn't matter what tools they use. Does it matter who they spoke to, who they collaborated with, what they looked up? Um, because the the result, the output isn't what's being evaluated. The process is what's being evaluated. The process is what really matters here. Sorry about that. The answer basically is when people ask how accurate is AI, how accurate is chat GPT, it really depends on what you're doing. And in general, if it's just doing a creative act, like removing speckles from photos, which is, I use that, I use a product called Topaz, because I do a lot of photography. And, uh, oops. So there's one of my photographs. And uh, when I originally took it, uh, I took it in low light, very high resolution and uh, the image that the camera captures has little speckles in it. It's called pixelation. So I use Topaz AI to normalize the image, to remove the little speckles so that all the colors are nice and smooth. AI is really good at that. To me, it doesn't matter whether a particular pixel was a particular shade of yellow. I'm trying to get a nice image, right? And so for me, uh, the AI is perfectly good. Uh, there's, many a comment, there's a comment oh. in chat to what degree can we expect output to be identical when given the same parameters? <laughs> Uh, that's an excellent question. Um, I'm just looking for my chat window, which I've now lost. Uh, come back to me. All right, here we go. Oh, there it is. Uh, excellent question. Oh, thanks, Christine. Um, it depends on, I mean, identical. It, well, it depends on the AI, but every time you put in your prompt, it's generating the image again. 
or is generating the text again. And it's very likely to produce something different. The more complex a thing you ask it to produce, the more likely it will produce something different because it generates it again. And there's, you know, a lot of this stuff is based on randomness and probability, uh, you know, depending on the exact kind of algorithm. You saw all those numbers that I showed earlier, depending on how you set up all those numbers, um, it'll be more or less random in some, in some ways. If you ask it something very specific, it's much more likely that it'll generate an identical response. If I asked chat GPT, what is the capital of France twice in a row? It'll say Paris twice in a row. And that's another factor, right? The overwhelming number of speakers in its database will say that Paris is the capital of France. So the likelihood is very small that we'll get a different answer. But if we ask it, what is the best capital in the world? We're probably going to get different responses, but eventually it'll begin to repeat responses because there's only so many capitals in the world. Um, <laughs> oh, and we're almost done as I can see. So we've got, Celeste has given us three takeaways from the meeting. Your presentation, oh, see full summary. Oh, <laughs> and she's created an Otter summary. Oh, isn't that cool? Otter is an AI program and it produces a summary. And so it's generated a transcript and uh, it's going to actually get automated automatic meeting notes. I think that's pretty cool, personally. How accurate is it? It's going to depend on the meeting. Um, and that's just it. Different AI programs do different things. Some AI programs, I think like that image one that I just used, keep a library of the images that they created for a certain prompt. And if you use the same prompt over and over again, it'll eventually come back and give you the same image it created before because it just keeps them in its database. So that's the sort of thing that programmers can do. AI can and will make things up. That's really important. People say AI is not creative, but it is creative. It makes mistakes all the time. It's not the best creativity in the world. But if you specifically ask for something, like say a reference, it'll create one. It might be a fake one, but it'll give you its best effort. And there's plenty of evidence for that. And these are called AI hallucinations. They're not really hallucinations, but if you give it all the data in the world and ask it to imagine something, it will imagine it, just like you. So, there's ethics of AI, different approaches. Uh, for teachers and educators, these are probably three of the most important points. First of all, protect student privacy. You know, don't capture student information and then use it in an AI system because the AI system will take that data and use it to train other stuff. So it's important to understand how student data is collected and stored. As we saw with the Cree example, AI will sometimes treat different languages differently. It'll treat different people from different ethnicities differently. And you gotta watch out for that. It will think that white male American sounding voices are normal. And of course, that would be a bias and that could harm students and people using AI. So we have to watch out for that. And then of course, digital citizenship, you know, we talked about how to give students examples uh, or uh, assignments, you know, and we wanna teach people to use AI ethically, you know, 
themselves thinking about bias and privacy concerns so that they don't just propagate the sorts of mistakes that AI can make. Government of Canada, of which I'm a part, but you know, I'm just mentioning these without necessarily endorsing them, although I think they're reasonably good. Do you want to use AI ethically? You need to understand and measure what AI is doing, right? Don't just take its results for granted. Look at the results. Ask yourself, is that an accurate result? If you can, measure it against something you know to be accurate. If you're using AI, be transparent about it. And that applies to everyone. So I used AI here in this presentation to generate all the panda images, because I can't draw that well, but I love the images. The rest of this presentation was created by me as a human. But just like you see, there's little links at the bottom of every, every one of my pages, right? I showed you where I got the information or the image or whatever that I put in the slide presentation. The same is the case for AI. If you use AI, make your source clear. If you can, and this is a challenge, provide an explanation for why the AI made the decision it did. But more importantly, I think, be as open as possible. And then finally, provide sufficient training for people. Give them actual experience and actual guidance in using AI. You know? And this kind of a talk is a first step, but it certainly should not be the last step. So that's everything I have. Um, and that's pretty much 12 o'clock, which is the end of our session. Um, and I do hope you found it interesting and useful. Uh, I'll hang around in case you have questions on the uh, chat. And uh, 